Hi, I'm Chris Randall, the co-owner of Audio Damage and uh, the principal designer. And I'm going to give you a walkthrough of Enso, our new looper plugin. Uh, before I start, note that this is version 0.2.0 0 .0, uh, that I'm working with here. This is a pre-release version. Uh, it's not out yet when I'm recording this. So uh, you have version 1. Point whatever, and there may be some minor differences. So uh, just keep that in mind as you're watching this. Um, the next thing to note is that there is a lot in this plugin, so this is going to take some time. Uh, you will really benefit from reading from RTFM on this one. <laughs> just uh, go grab the manual off our website and uh, at least go over the the parts you're not comfortable with because there's a this is a deep plugin and uh, and it's fairly complex and. Uh, You'll, you'll get a lot more out of it if you just uh, go and read the manual. All right, the upper left-hand quadrant of Enso is the steering wheel of the plugin. This is where you record an overdub and uh, all that jazz. Uh, it's got four transport buttons, record, overdub, play, and stop. And then it's got a trigger section which will automatically switch the modes uh, depending on how you have it set up. Uh, this is as it's instance. I just instanced it and uh, and started this video. So this is how you'll see it when you first get it. Um, the trigger button always shows what's going to happen if you hit it. If you think of a foot pedal looper, you've got the one button where you record play, overdub play, and it just switches back and forth. Uh, this trigger button works the same way, and you have quite a bit of control over what it, how it's going to work. Uh, with length unit and mode quantizing free, everything is just working irrespective of what your DAW is doing. Um, note that the transport of the DAW has to be running for and so to do anything at all. Uh, now with that said, the trigger button will record when I hit it, when I hit it again, it will go to whatever post record is, in this case overdub, and then when I hit it again, it'll go to whatever the opposite of that is, which is play. So record, overdub, play is how is what's gonna happen right here. Record, I hit it again, over, overdub. And I hit it again and it's play. Now the next time I hit it, as you see, it'll be overdub. Right. And this uh, button, this X here, clears it and sets the transport up for recording again. So they, you'll, you'll be hitting, see me hit that a lot. Uh, now, it will quantize those trigger hits uh, based on mode quantize. Like if I set mode quantize to measure, then the trigger button can only be hit on measure crossings. So I've got a drum loop here, so we'll be able to hear that. Uh, with free, uh, it will wait for the next trigger press to go to do its next state. So I'm going to set it to play here. So I'll press record, then it will uh, wait for me to press trigger again and it'll go to play. So you see that was all perfectly quantized and the loop is now a one measure loop per my uh, DAW's idea of whatever a measure is. Now, uh, once you've recorded that initial loop, it no longer cares about mode quantize. That's just for the initial recording and ending of the first trigger event. If you set the length unit, like I can, if I set it to measure, then if it's anything but free, then it'll record. <clears throat> excuse me, it'll record length molt numbers, and then it'll go automatically to whatever post record is. So. Uh, then you have your one button looping there, and which is super nice if you're uh, if you're using them as a, for a live looping situation. You don't have to worry about it going into record and messing up the length or anything. Uh, so so right now you can set this to uh, to a lot of different numbers, <laughs> and uh, I'm just gonna leave it at one. So what's gonna happen is I'll press it. It'll go into record on the measure crossing. It'll record for one measure, and then it will go into play on its own. Here we go. There, and it created a one measure loop, and I didn't have to do anything at all. 
Now the, uh, uh, let's see here, the input monitor gives you some measure of control over how the uh, routing works while you're uh, looping. I usually personally leave it in record and stop all the time. And that means that when the transport is stopped, even if the DAW is running, if there's nothing in the loop and it's not playing, you can hear, you get, it passes the audio through. Uh, in, and it'll also pass it through whenever it's overdubbing or recording. It won't pass it through when it's playing. Uh, if I set it to record, it'll only pass it, like I'm playing the keyboard right now, and it's not passing anything. You can see the input's up. Uh, it'll only pass it when it's overdubbing and recording. If you set it to never, it will never pass the input. I, um, and then always is if you want to record a loop and then jam over it. So uh, let's clear that out. So you'll hear that I'll record one measure and then it'll automatically switch to play and then I can play over the top of that. Anyhow, so you get the idea. I usually leave this in record and stop. It's just the handiest mode for general looping purposes. You can you can hear your sounds and set them up and whatnot. Now feedback, uh, kind of depends on what dub and place is doing. So a dub and place on, and so works just like Ableton Looper or every looping pedal ever made, where it takes your input and it mixes it with the buffer at whatever percent this is. So the input's always 100%. And then the buffer is whatever feedback is. So if I uh, set this to 50%, You'll see, I'll record a loop and then I'll go straight into overdub and you'll see the level of the buffer go down. See how it gets smaller every, it loses half its volume every pass through. Now with feedback 100%, It never loses any volume. So I think you get the general idea. There. That's with dub and place on. Now, things get a little complicated when we turn dub and place off. And I strongly advise you to read the manual, read the dub and place section of the manual, if you don't read anything else about this plugin. Just read that because this changes the structure internally. With it on, it works like a looper plug-in or a pedal. With it off, it works like a pair of tape decks or frippertronics, as, uh, as us old farts call them, where the loop goes through, is played through all the uh, effects, arrives at loop output, and then gets mixed with the input per the level here. Uh, and I'll try to show what I mean by that um because I chose an electric piano sound you can't really hear it so with dub and place off you'll hear that the saturation like uh, with it with it on it just goes through the saturation after everything's done and then out the output with it off it goes through the saturation and then back in so the saturation will stack and gradually degrade the loop so with the filters and the chorus uh, you have to be a little careful with this because uh, it removes some of the safety net that uh, that prevents o level overs and whatnot, and uh, so you can you can get pretty outlandish pretty quickly. So now it's overdubbing through the saturation. And you can hear how it gets. So if you want to do Frippertronic style stuff, 
then you want dub and place off so you can record the effects and such. Yeah, it's, it works essentially like a pair of tape decks at that point. There's really uh, not much more to it than that. So if you want it to work like Ableton Looper, leave that on. If you want it to work like uh, t you have two Nagras and you're doing crazy Robert Fripp chord stacking, take that off. <laughs> All right, the section I want to talk about now is sectors up here in the upper right-hand corner. The uh, And so can only record one loop, or record and play one loop at a time, but you get four different start and length parameters, and you can crossfade between them, essentially. And then this little guy here comes into play, which is a sector... Uh, we call it the sector dump, but but uh, I'm not sure what Adam is going to call it in the manual. But uh, this clears out a sector, essentially. So, uh, the values are in degrees. So if I have 0 as my starting point, you can see the start move there. Uh, and if I make it 90 degrees, that's a quarter of whatever the measure is. Uh, 360 divided by 4 is 90. Uh, and you can see that the outside circle, which is sector 1, has uh, gotten smaller, and it shows you the, what the sector is. Now if we go to sector 2, and we make that start of 90, and a length of 90, and you can see it's there. And sector 3, let's do a start of 180 which is halfway, a length of 90, which is a quarter, and sector 4, start of 270, which is 3 quarters of the way, and a length of 90, whoops, can't go past the end, 270, and a length of 90, so you can see 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, see they light up a little brighter, 2, 3, 4. Now these aren't quantized in any way, so you can, uh, other than when you press play, whatever selectors, whatever, sorry, whatever sector is selected will start at the beginning of that sector. Uh, so if you want to, you can, sectors are a parameter, it's one parameter for, for all four, so you can uh, automate it however you see fit. And it's also a MIDI target, which I'll talk about in the MIDI chapter. So that's pretty dope. But the real fun starts when you jack up the crossfade. Now this is in seconds. So if we set 1.5 as a crossfade. So you can hear it's crossfading between the four sectors. Now this gets really nice when you put a foot controller to this or something to uh, uh, crossfade different parts of an ambient loop or whatever. Now, the next cool thing about sectors, so let's go to sector two here. We're in. Uh, the overdubbing, the trigger button, respects the sector, so whatever sector you have selected. Now, if you're recording a, from an empty loop, uh, if, even if you have sector 1 is a quarter, this is, gets ignored when you're in your first record. Uh, and it doesn't come into effect until the loop exists. But uh, this button here will clear just that sector. So you can see that's clear. And the uh, overdub and record respect the sector once the loop exists. So if I just go into record, whoops, I should probably done that in overdub. So 
So you can actually uh, get down and dirty and re-record bits of a loop that already exists, which is kind of fun. I like to load in other loops and then overdub little bits on top of them. So this brings a new opportunity to play loops that uh, like you can assign MIDI buttons to that and, and play them with your MIDI controller or or automate it. It's just kind of a uh, kind of a nifty thing there that Enzo can do. All right, the last thing I'm going to talk about on the main panel is the speed control, which is the lower right hand quadrant of the uh, operation here. Uh, this is where Enso really departs from a normal looper, other than with the possible exception of the Montreal Assembly count to five pedal. At least that's all I'm aware of that will do this kind of stuff. And even then, it only does a part of it. So, uh, what we have here is independent control over the play and record heads. Now the playhead is what is playing back whatever is in the buffer. And the record head is whatever is writing to the buffer. And you have independent control over the speed of those two and direction of those two heads. Uh, when link is on, play speed is in charge. It, uh, you don't even look at record speed, it doesn't matter. Uh, when link is off, the two values uh, are independent of each other. Uh, I'm going to take the second here to talk about these obloid controls. Most of them, uh, they just go up and down uh, with their plus minus buttons, however you would. You can also, on all of them, you can double click and enter a value or uh, double tap it on iOS. And then you can, of course, just drag them with either your finger or your mouse, depending on whether you're using a touch screen or not. Now, the values that you see are rounded. Uh, so sometimes when you double click, it won't be exactly it because it follows tables to do the uh, some of the increment and decrement. And uh, visually, it'll be rounded, but when you double click it, you'll see the true value. Now these two controls have their own setting for those plus minus buttons. You can uh, up down 0 0.01, 0 0.1, down half of whatever the value is, and up uh, up twice whatever the value is, up down a semitone, and these follow tables so if you go off a little bit the next time you increment it'll go right to the, there are, uh, these are quantized, or quantized. Uh, up down an octave, which is where I personally usually leave it just because of the way I make music that's the way I prefer to have it, and then up down fifth an octave. Now if you click, uh, if you have it on that, you go up, it goes up a, a fifth, and then the next click is an octave. Up a fifth, next click is an octave. And uh, down, it goes down to the fifth above the octave below. So, so it's always keeping that same note. Uh, otherwise it would get harmonically weird, right? Uh, as I said, I usually keep it on plus minus octave, and if I need a weird value, I can scroll to it or enter it with the text. Uh, I'm going to record a loop real quick. All right, now you can, uh, now we're going to start to see some of the things that and so is really capable of here. Uh, the interesting thing about dragging this value is that it goes through zero can just re reverse it. And since we're linked, the record head is following the playhead. It'll always be locked to it. But you can drag it. Check this out. Through zero. And back the other way. That is nifty right there. Uh, now, the things start to get really crazy when you uh, unlink them. Uh, when the values are the same, it's going to try and keep the heads 
aligned, but they may get off by a, a bit, you know, just in the nature of things. <laughs> Now you can hear that the record head and the playhead are playing the same speed. So if I drop the playhead and I'm still recording at one time, if I'm recording it, if I'm playing back at halftime, anything I record is going to be played back an octave lower. Here, everything I just played is playing back an octave lower. Uh, the same works in the other direction. If I drop the record head below or to an octave below and I'm playing back normal, then everything I play will play back an octave higher. I think you get the gist of that. Uh, if you could hit this this one one button here, we just put as a handy utility, and it puts them both back to forward one time. So. And RTZ puts them back to zero. So here comes the crazy stuff. Say uh, record head is going forward at one time. So. I'm playing back backwards. I can record forwards and play backwards. Now you're going to get uh, just the way the heads are flying past each other. You're going to get a little, might be a little click here and there. Uh, that's really kind of unavoidable in this. If you don't want any clicks, then keep it linked and one one one, and uh, and you're good to go. But when we're getting into this, is a sort of semi-experimental, and it's going to be a little strange. Uh, hey, want to record forward at full speed and play back halfward backwards at half speed? <laughs> Uh, and also, one of the interesting things here, I'm going to go to uh, semitone mode to show this off. The uh, If the heads are unlinked when dub in place is off, the speed change will stack. Just like as if it was a delay where you are a tape figure, a, uh, I think about a, uh, like a RU201 where you drop the uh, time and the pitch goes down. Uh, or a pitch shifter where you're pitching, you know, and the and the pitch will uh, will barber pull. This will do that too. So I'm going to uh, clear the loop out. All right, so we're just playing. So I just dropped it a semitone. If I go into overdub with dub and place off. You can see the record head is rate is going a little faster than the playhead. And you can hear that barber pulling if I switch change that to octave. Let's do that backwards. can see uh, and so can get pretty carried away I find that this is really nice to uh, create beds and stuff for for uh, ambient music 
So like just say for instance we record it looping at one one. Drop that down. Throw a little reverb on there, some delay. Some saturation, a little high pass. Maybe a touch of chorus. Yes. that is I think pretty cool all right now we're gonna uh, talk about the MIDI and settings panel uh, so it defaults to that that's the normal view and then you hit here and you go to your MIDI stuff this is where you assign the MIDI CC uh, obviously the continuous parameters and drop downs and such like will respond to normal automation uh, and if your host has MIDI to automation or MIDI to parameters you can just uh, use it that way however many of the controls in ENSO are momentary and uh, it's bad form to automate momentary controls uh, there isn't really a methodology for that in plugin land so we gave it its own MIDI CC input and uh, in most hosts, you'll have to set up a separate channel for that. So I have this MIDI channel here. I have the input from my Nectar Pacer, which is a MIDI foot controller. And uh, I have the monitor set to in. So normally it's auto, obviously. You want it in to pass everything through. The MIDI is going to the channel. And then under that, you get this drop down and you select ENSO 1. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's a MIDI input, it has 16 inputs, but it just merges them, so I just select the first one. <clears throat> now, uh, to assign a MIDI value, your choice is, uh, it's really only going to be happy with buttons. You can use knobs, but it's going to be anything over 50% is on and anything under is off. And these are really for the momentary control, so you really want to use buttons or a foot controller for them. Uh, all you do is you click on that and then you click your button and there you go it's assigned and uh, I usually in my normal setup I usually use four of them Whoops. and boom one. so uh, the, if you want a clear one you just hit that X Uh, and these can be stored in a preset, so you can, uh, they're per preset, not per instance or global. So uh, you can save them for different configurations, however you need it. Uh, and then we weren't really sure. Some people like it when you let go of the button, 
and some people like it when you hit the button. Uh, timing is better when you let go of the button, but it's more comfortable sometimes to have it when you hit it. So we put in both. Uh, so the way I normally set up is I use the I, almost all the momentary controls. Actually, I think all of them uh, can be assigned this way. So I generally use the trigger button um, for. Uh, let me set this to free time. Uh, I, I generally set the trigger button to my first one when I'm playing my roads or whatever, and I just want to uh, use the foot controller to drive in. So, so, and that works just like it is if you had clicked it. So my my transport's playing. I hit hit the foot button, and we're recording. Hit it again, and it goes to a post record mode. In this case, play. Hit it again. I'm in overdub. Right, you get the idea. And then I usually set the clear loop, which is this button here. Oh, I guess he named that clear sector. That that would uh, explain that. Uh, clear loop, which is this button. I give that one, too. And then uh, just because it's handy because I mess up a lot. <laughs> and uh, it's nice to just clear it and start over. And then uh, there's a few different things you can do. Uh, I like to do the my third button. I do it. Uh, overdub on press and play on release and that way it will just overdub while I'm holding it down so if I just play and that's kind of fun that's kind of fun to do something like this yeah so I'm just tapping the button uh, you can, whoops, you can set one to reverse, play reverse, so that's the MIDI implementation, I think that that uh, covers most needs, but if we miss something, we uh, feel free to tell us, we can always add it, uh, if it's something that we feel that everybody will like. And uh, uh, don't bother leaving in the comments. Just uh, drop us an email via our web page. Now, uh, the, so there are eight of these, and you can, uh, and as I said, they're saved per preset. And then the final thing on this panel is the long memory button. We uh, were mildly concerned that the RAM footprint would be uh, unmanageable on older systems. So the way this uh, is set up is at uh, 48K stereo, obviously, and so it's just a stereo plug-in. Uh, at 48K, it's got five minutes as when you instance it. It's got five minutes of uh, memory. Now, if uh, at uh, 96, that's going to be two and a half minutes. At if you're running at 44.1, it's going to be a little more, like uh, like five and three quarters minutes, something like that. So it depends on your sample rate. If you hit the long memory button, that RAM footprint doubles. So that at 48K, that's 10 minutes. Uh, and now it doesn't go into effect until you record a new loop. But uh, our thinking was that 10 minutes was a really long time and probably plenty for anyone. Now on iOS, it's half of that. So at 48K, when it's off, the loop length is two and a half minutes and when it's on it's five minutes so if you need a really long loop it's there for you but we uh, we suggest you keep it off in normal use if you got a lot of samples in your project if it's got a big RAM overhead you want to uh, you know common sense should apply if you've only got if you're just working with Enso and making this big layered loop and you and it's gonna be super long then by all means turn it on but if you've got a bunch of plugins and samples and whatnot in your project, you probably just want to leave it off. I mean, realistically, you're not going to need a loop that's over two and a half minutes long unless you're doing some sort of art project or whatever. All right, and the last thing to cover is the uh, preset. Now, the preset engine in, uh, and so is more or less, if you're familiar with our more recent products uh, 
it's it's similar to to all of them um so you get it by hitting this little disc here and uh obviously i don't have any factory presets yet because i haven't written them yet <laughs> and uh which i'll probably do this weekend before we ship it uh, in the user section i have a couple and we can talk about how this works um normally if you can just save a preset however actually may, let me make a quick loop here so if i just go to save that i'll just call it derp derp uh if i switch to it uh there's no loop in there so you, uh, if you save it, just normally save it, it's basically just saving the settings of the panel, but the loop is empty. Now, if I go to, if I record a quick loop, and I turn this button on, save buffer in preset, it will save the audio with the preset. So if I turn that on and I go save, and call this one herp uh, if I switch to derp you'll see that no loop I switch to herp you see there's a loop um, we were we were a little torn about how to pull this off and that seemed like the the most elegant solution for being able to save so you can make your big loop and uh, and save it and uh, and there it is. Uh, the other thing you can do is you can save the buffer. So if I go to save, and uh, uh, if I it auto names it, it names it the tempo and the date, and it's a wave file. It's a stereo wave file, and it'll save whatever the contents of the buffer are. So uh, the one thing is that it always saves it with the play speed at one forward. So if you recorded your epic backwards. 0.25 speed loop when you save it it's going to be one times forward and you'll have to adjust that in your uh, in your uh, DAW however but uh, the so the, the opportunity exists to dump the buffer to disk and by the same token you can load the buffer so if I'll go to load if I go to my samples burp, 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 if I go to uh, let's go to Don Loops. So I just double click that. Open what? The, oh, there it goes. And now, whoops. So it's going to make the loop size whatever that uh, whatever the loop length is. It's loading the entire audio file and looping it. So if the tempo doesn't match, then obviously uh, it's going to be out of time. But, you know, whether that's important to you or not. And this is non-destructive, so once you've got it in there and you start, start messing with it or whatever, uh, then you can save it as a new loop, or it's not going to hurt the original file at all. And uh, you can copy and paste the presets. The copy and paste do not carry the audio data. The reason for that is some, like iOS, like the handoff and stuff, uh, won't work with a file that big. That's uh, it's technically a text file, and it's gonna freak out. Um, and say if you've got an eight-minute loop in there, and you try to paste it to your iPhone, uh, shit's gonna get crazy, you know. So we just <laughs> so the copy and paste, which you were probably familiar with from our other products. Uh, they work here too, they just don't copy the audio. And uh, I think that about covers it. Get that in there, 23 skidoo loop. So I hope you uh, enjoy Enso. If you have any questions or comments, uh, feel free to let us know. And uh, we're going to go back to the lab and think of something new now.